again to some guided meta meditation and uh, as we all know this is a special offering for Ajahn Brahm's birthday um, because he says and the Buddha also says that the best way to pay respects to such noble beings to our teachers to our benefactors is actually to practice the Dhamma to actually transform our hearts in line with the Dhamma and so this is really the best gift we can offer. And it's also a gift to each other because I think the power of group practice can't be underestimated. I've been doing a lot of Zoom sessions during the coronavirus lockdown in England. We've had a lot of lockdowns all year long. And uh, at first I wasn't sure how effective it would be. But I've realized that there's a power in the group space, in the group holding, um, that seems to go beyond just tuning into each other's little boxes on the computer screen, but it becomes an actual tangible sense of other people supporting us. And um, I've also sat some meditation with Ajahn Brahm and another teacher of mine, Bhante Ujagara, and it's fascinating to me that I can actually feel their energy. It's a very distinct sense of how it feels to sit with them in person. I can feel that through the Zoom sessions. So it just shows the power of sitting together, that we're somehow connecting with each other, even though we're miles and miles away. So I'm very glad that not only are people sitting in Jana Grove to share the practice, but probably internationally all over this world. So, And hopefully the devas are also joining in and rejoicing in the goodness of our practice. So today I wanted to talk about metta again, and particularly practice some metta towards ourselves because sometimes ourselves are the last people that we <laughs> have meta towards or the people that we struggle most with because we're so close to ourselves. We know all our um, little idiosyncrasies and you know, so-called weaknesses or things that we've been taught are weaknesses. And sometimes we have this really negative habit of talking to ourselves in ways that's quite undermining and quite um, unhelpful, di- discouraging, Um, some teachers call this the inner tyrant there's like this little voice inside ourselves that's always putting us down and if you could take that voice out and amplify it and show it to other people we'd feel probably quite ashamed quite embarrassed because we'd never talk to other people that way so I wanted to talk about self meta so that we can learn to love ourselves to value ourselves to see the goodness in ourselves And we'll probably start by reflecting a little bit on our own goodness or some of our qualities that are there. Maybe they haven't come to fulfillment yet, but nevertheless, we can see their potential. We can recognize these as beautiful things to cultivate. And I think this is also a gift to Ajahn Brown because I don't know about other people, but throughout the time that I've been a close disciple of his, um, he's, he's always trying to teach me to have more loving kindness for myself because he knows that that will make me happier and that will make me more able to give and to share with others. So he wants to show us our value. He wants to show us that we are, we do have everything it takes to walk on this beautiful eightfold path. Whether we believe it or not, he knows that, you know, he's done it himself. And as he often tries to tell us, which we don't quite believe, he's also not perfect. You know, he wasn't perfect. He was a a teenager who went out with his friends and had a bit too much to drink. You know, he did uh, um, not always have right view. You know, it's actually a a process. And we're so fortunate, incredibly fortunate to have wise teachers on this path. That alone shows, you know, that we are doing something right to have come across such wonderful conditions. And so it's a gift to Ajahn Brahm if we can start to love ourselves, we can start to become good enough, satisfied within ourselves and less dependent on others for our well-being and happiness, for that sense of being valued. So we can become independent in the practice. And I just wanted to say a few more words about the metta practice, because it can be a very powerful practice that can take us all the way into the deep states of jhanas, into samadhi, just as anapanasati can do. And um, for many of us, it might not be our main vehicle, but it can be our main vehicle in practice. And it has certain qualities um, about it, such as The fact that metta is generally, and not limited to, but generally a very pleasant experience. 
So we're not looking for a special experience, but it tends to flow along with the practice of metta that we'll feel a sense of well-being and ease over time. And so that pleasantness really increases uh, the proximate cause for samadhi, which is happiness. Yeah, Sukino chitam samadhiati. Happiness is the proximate cause or the cause for samadhi. So metta has that very special quality of happiness, of PT, of sukha. And in that way, it's a very powerful means to enter into the jhanas. Also, of course, it overcomes ill will, which is one of those very sticky defilements that sometimes we don't even notice in our mind. Just that slight sense of resistance or not quite wanting or pulling away from experience. Even if you don't have outright aversion to yourself or another person, sometimes it's there. It's limiting um, ourselves. And again, self-aversion, not feeling good enough, not feeling that we deserve deep meditation, uh, not feeling we've yet worked hard enough. Sometimes I have that. So th this practice of loving kindness can be taken all the way into the deep samadhi. And of course, once you have those deep states of samadhi where the hindrances are temporarily knocked aside, um, you have the possibility to see things as they truly are. Yeah. And there's actually a beautiful sutta. I just wanted to read a few words because it's not only that from samadhi we see things as they truly are. Metta also has the potential for reflection. And in this particular sutta, it's from Majjhima 52. The Buddha says that when we have developed loving kindness and we've spread it in all the four directions, yeah, and it's become vast, exalted, measureless, without hostility, without ill will, then we can consider and understand it thus. This liberation of mind by loving kindness is constructed and produced by volition. But whatever is constructed and produced by volition is unpermanent and subject to cessation. If one is firm in this, one attains the destruction of the influxes or the outflowings, as Ajahn Brahm refers to the asawas. But if one does not attain the destruction of the outflowings because of attachment to the Dhamma or delight in the Dhamma, then with the utter destruction of the five lower fetters, one becomes one of spontaneous birth due to attain final Nibbana there without ever returning from that world. So essentially then these loving kindness meditations, these Brahma Viharas can actually take us all the way into deep Samadhi and also into the insight that even those states are conditioned and will ultimately end. It's not the final goal. And that alone can be a cause for... Um, for our attachment to fade away and for us to experience the higher fruits on the path. In this case, the Buddha is referring to the stages of anagami and full enlightenment, arahat. But don't worry if you feel very far away from that, because the Buddha also says that even if you were to develop loving kindness for the time it takes to pull a cow's udder or for a finger snap, that alone is worth more than giving a thousand pots of food to the hungry. Can you imagine just one finger snap? And I sometimes think, why is that? Surely feeding so many people is more beneficial. But I think it's because we're purifying the mind at the depth. We're purifying our intentions. And intention is karma. Intention is the whole inclination of our mind. So if we purify our mind at that level, in the long run, we're going to be giving much, much more charity and service to others. We're going to really develop a very generous heart, a heart free from enmity and ill will a heart that's capable of really um, progressing on the path, but then serving others. And I think it's important to take um, our teachers, not only as people to revere, but also examples of what we want to develop. And one of the things that attracted to me Ajahn, to Ajahn Brahm in the beginning, when I first heard his talks, I was actually still meditating in Myanmar, and I heard his Reigns talks from the early 2000s and late 1990s. And uh, it was very clear that he has an extremely profound experience of meditation. And also he would talk about the service that he gives, going to Singapore, giving a talk to 4,000 people, you know, and that's become regular for him. And I just thought, this is, this is what I want, you know, I want to develop myself in Dhamma, but also be of benefit to others. And so let's, on his birthday, develop ourselves on the path so that we too can become a source of benefit for this world. So with that, let's begin. 
So please, as usual, adjust your posture if you need to, or even if you don't think you need to. <laughs> it might just show your body that you're here to care. And this is especially important with loving kindness practices. It's not the time to start working with aches and pains, analyzing the nature of that pain. So see if you need to adjust your limbs. And establish a posture that is both upright and alert and yet relaxed. And just gently passing your kind awareness, your loving awareness through the body, checking it out part by part to see if anything needs to be loosened up. Maybe a roll of your shoulders, a stretch of your neck. Check if any clothing is a little tight. that your weight is evenly balanced between the buttocks or the knees, the feet, if you're sitting on a chair. And just see if you can welcome this body into the space. Establishing mindfulness as a priority in the beginning of the meditation. Just giving yourself time to arrive.
And if you wish, I'd like to invite you to just connect with or remember a quality within yourself that you can really value and appreciate, that you can respect. Or it may be a kind deed that you've performed recently, something you've done to help someone else. Or even to care for yourself. And see if that recollection brings a sense of uplift and encouragement to the mind. When you connect to your own goodness, to the beautiful qualities in your heart. Perhaps you are quite a patient person. Perhaps you try to be kind. Perhaps you have a great love for the Dhamma, a lot of sadha, devotion, confidence, faith. Maybe your sincerity or willingness to make mistakes. Whatever it is, see if you can recognize the beauty that's there in your heart and that you can continue to cultivate. If you are recollecting something you maybe said or done recently, that was good, that was kind, or even something that you didn't do, perhaps you stopped yourself saying an unkind word to someone else. See if you can connect with how that felt.
Notice any softening, any uplift in the heart. And gently letting this reflection fade and coming in contact once again with your body, perhaps the area around the chest or any place where you feel fairly pleasant or neutral sensations, a sense of ease. But the mind can easily rest. We're going to start just generating metta towards ourselves. You may do this however you wish. Sometimes to get this going, it can be helpful to use some phrases. And it's best when these phrases really capture your deepest, most sincere wish for your own well-being. So see what you really wish for yourself right now. So recently I've been practicing with four phrases which I'll share just as a guidance or an idea. And I say these phrases 
as though offering myself a beautiful gift. Or planting a seed in fertile soil. And then I listen between each phrase to the resonance of those words, to the meaning, the experience of loving kindness, trusting in the power of those intentions to bring about the experience of loving kindness in the heart. May I be happy. Deeply content. May I be healed. May suffering end. You may choose to have only one phrase or even just spontaneously generate a feeling of metta towards yourself, whatever you find helpful. But keep on inclining the mind in the direction of loving kindness towards yourself. Rejoicing in giving yourself this gift without expecting anything in return.
And if you find your mind wanders away, very gently, patiently, bring it back to your body, to any pleasant feelings over there. And once again, connect with your most deeply heartfelt wish for yourself. And repeat the words if they help you within your mind. Pausing between each phrase to allow the mind to incline in the direction of loving kindness.
You may find that as your mind quietens or gets into the groove of loving kindness, the spaces between each phrase lengthen. Or maybe you drop down to fewer words. You may even find that the mind starts to experience the breath along with the loving kindness. Just see how your mind inclines. Either continuing with loving kindness or using that loving kindness as a platform from which to move into the breath so that that breath becomes the object now of your loving kindness. You treat that breath with utmost tender care. So I'll be quiet now for some minutes. And see where this process takes you.
So we're coming close to the end of this meditation now. Before we end, let's take time to spread our loving kindness a little bit further. Starting once again with ourselves. Connecting to any pleasant sensations in your body, perhaps in the area of the heart, the chest, if that's comfortable for you. Noticing any peace or contentment that has arisen. Regarding that as a valuable jewel. However subtle it may be. And once again wishing yourself well. May I be happy. Deeply content. May I be healed. May all suffering end. And bring to mind now all the people that may be sitting in the meditation space, either at Jhana Grove or other Dhamma halls around the world. If you're alone, imagining all these beings, maybe hundreds, thousands of people, sitting in metta meditation, cultivating the mind in such beautiful ways and spread metta to all these people, our fellow practitioners, Kalyana Mittas on the spiritual path. May we all be happy. May we all be peaceful. May we all be fully liberated. Imagining all these beautiful beings smiling, glowing, radiating love. And you're part of this. And now together, let's imagine ourselves generating all our loving kindness, our gratitude, our reverence and respect towards our teacher Ajahn Brahm on his birthday. May Ajahn Brown be happy, deeply happy, fully content.
May he be safe from danger. Be healthy. May he experience the bliss of Dhamma. Every moment of his life. May he continue to serve selflessly, inspiring many, many beings on this path. May all beings benefit from Ajahn Brahm's life and from the goodness of our combined practice. May all beings find peace, be free from suffering. May all wars end May weapons be laid aside. May all those who are hungry find food, nourishment, safety and ease. May there be no more divisions No more hatred and enmity. May loving kindness prevail.
So I'll close with a little blessing for everyone. And please see if you can just receive these blessings, allowing them to suffuse your body and mind. Sabe Sata Sabe Pana Sabe Buddha Sabe Pugala Sabe Atta Bawa Pariapana Sabe Hitio Sabe Purisa Sabe Aria Sabe Anavia Sabe Dewa Sabe Manusa Sabe Winipadika I wave a horn to I be a patcha horn to I need a horn to Sukiatanam Baviharantu Dukamunjantu Yada lada sampatito Maui gajantu Kamasaka Sad Sad Sadu <laughs> Very good. So please continue to enjoy your practice in whatever way is good for you. <laughs>